Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Uh, welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and with me today is Kathleen Turner. Hello, Mike. <laughs> Matthew has a cold. Matthew stalked, and you've got the lurgy. I have the dreaded lurgy. Yeah, it's not good. You you sound like uh, Kathleen. Kathleen Turner. That's what you messaged me. <laughs> I, I love her voice. Yeah, she's got a very sort of smoky voice. Yeah, for sure. But you don't smoke. I don't think smoky voice means you smoke. But that's where it's kind of from. Isn't? Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know the etymology of I smoky do. voice? So this is a, a redo of episode five. So moving forward, when you go to look for episode five, it won't be there. It'll be gone. And the reason that I'm redoing it this way is because, oh my gosh, I go back and I listen to some of those episodes and I am so embarrassed. I got facts wrong. Like in this one in particular, I got a lot of facts wrong. And I didn't expand on things as much as I would have liked to. I talked about the perpetrator more. Than, okay. than the actual victims. So I'm more interested in hearing about that. Good. You do the redo that you do so well, Mike. Yeah. We're going to redo a bunch of the old episodes and we'll do it like this. We'll bring you new information. We'll expand on things. It'll be better. And I'm starting to realize I have a cold too. Anyway, let's move forward. With this one. I, how did you get to, I didn't kiss you. No, you didn't. How did you get the cold? I don't know. I could have got the lurgy from anybody. Oh. So, you know, I go out and about. Out and about. Out and about. But, uh, but yeah, so this is part one of two, and we are talking about the crimes of Mark Andrew Twitchell. Ugh. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Patine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In October 2008, 38-year-old Johnny Altinger was looking for love online and thinking he'd found it, was lured to his death in a dingy South Edmonton, Alberta garage. Johnny believed he would meet the girl of his dreams, but he was met in the darkness of the garage by a Star Wars and Dexter Morgan-obsessed serial killer wannabe, 29-year-old amateur filmmaker Mark Andrew Twitchell. This is Dark Poutine episode 265, Hollow Man. The Crimes of Mark Twitchell, Part 1. I got into a little hot water with some of our listeners describing Edmonton in Episode 5, my first attempt at telling this story. Although my digs were meant for fun, they didn't land so well with some Edmontonians. So let's try this again. I want to make some amends. Edmonton, Alberta, where this story takes place, is the province's capital. It's located in central Alberta and situated along the North Saskatchewan River. 
The area where the city now stands has been inhabited for thousands of years by various indigenous groups, including the Cree and Blackfoot. The first European to explore the area was Anthony Hende, a fur trader with the Hudson's Bay Company in the mid-18th century. In the late 19th century, the arrival of the Canadian Pacific Railway and the expansion of the fur trade helped to establish Edmonton as an important commercial and transportation hub. In 1905, when Alberta became a province of Canada, Edmonton was named the capital. The city grew rapidly during the early 20th century with the discovery of oil in the nearby Leduc No. 1 oil field in 1947, leading to the development of the city's energy industry. Over the years, Edmonton has hosted several significant events, including the 1978 Commonwealth Games, the 1983 Universiad Games, and the 2001 World Championships in Athletics. The city is also home to several major festivals and cultural events, including the Edmonton Folk Festival, the Edmonton International Fringe Festival, and the Edmonton International Film Festival. Today, Edmonton is a diverse and vibrant city with a population of over 1 million people. It's known for its beautiful river valley, the largest urban parkland in North America, and its many cultural attractions, including museums, galleries, and theaters. The city is also home to a thriving business community and is considered one of the fastest growing cities in Canada. Edmonton is also home of the storied NHL team, the Oilers. The team was founded in 1971 as one of the original World Hockey Association teams, WHA, and joined the NHL in 1979. The Oilers quickly became a powerhouse team in the 1980s, winning five Stanley Cup championships in a seven-year span from 84 to 90, led by legendary players such as Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, ugh, for Vancouver fans, and Paul Coffey. Although the team has gone through some rough patches in recent years, they continue to have a loyal and passionate fan base in Edmonton and beyond. The Oilers play their home games at Rogers Place, which opened in 2016 and is considered one of the NHL's most advanced and state-of-the-art arenas. The team has had some talented players in recent years, including the current captain, Connor McDavid, considered one of the best players in the world. With a mix of veteran experience and young talent, the Oilers are always a team to watch in the NHL, and their fans have high hopes for their success in the future. You know what I noticed about Edmonton when I visited? What? So my, my aunt and uncle and cousins live there now. Yeah. And uh, it was sort of, um, my cousins have two little girls, Lenai and Niara. Yeah. And they were doing sports weekend. Sure. Edmonton has these massive, mm -hmm. well-maintained indoor sports complexes right like yeah. i've never seen in my life they're incredible mike yeah the, uh, i i noticed that about it edmonton is really easily laid out and easy to get around and and i noticed that too there's all kinds of do you think it's because of the weather so they're like okay let's build sports complexes yeah, that's probably a hundred percent and it's so different you know i had this like 10 year old cousin doing like track and field yeah. You know, in my day, there's like a farmer at the end of the race, just <laughs> like shouting out who won. Right. right. Yeah. But there they had like to the millisecond, like everyone's time. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, White Ave is really cool in Edmonton. Okay. Um, there's actually big music scene in Edmonton and White Ave has lots of bars and clubs where musicians play. Cool. Yeah. So the murder victim of this story, Johnny Altinger, his hometown was Edmonton. And he was born there on a bright and sunny day, April 28, 1970, at the Royal Alexander Hospital. And from a young age, Johnny was drawn to technology and had an insatiable thirst for knowledge. When he was 12, he received a Commodore 64, a revolutionary piece of technology in 1982. It came with a bulky keyboard, a floppy disk drive, and a squat screen. Commodore's goal was to make its 64 kilobyte computers available in every home and they promoted it as the personal computer with professional power. Johnny had a natural talent for computers and was fascinated by their capabilities even at that early age. You know, we laugh at the Commodore 64 now. Sure. But um, guys like Johnny who geeked out on them, mm -hmm. like my husband as well, sure. who's now a software developer. Right. Commodore 64 was the first real mass home computer. Home computer, yeah. And it, and it brought um, innovation on, on a sort of a mass scale with people like Johnny, sort of experimenting and trying mm -hmm. things. Yeah. It can't be understated how important that, that, that system Agreed. was. Agreed, yeah. 
According to Johnny's older brother, Gary Altinger, Johnny was always willing to lend a hand to help others, even at the cost of his own responsibilities. Gary mentioned how countless times Johnny had helped him by word processing term papers, essays, and other important assignments while attending university. Johnny's technical skills were impressive, and he could assist older people. Gary and the rest of the family were proud of Johnny's abilities to help others. In the late 1980s, Johnny was a part of a group of computer-savvy people in the Vancouver area who used modems to connect with other computers around the city. Johnny and Glenn Ritchie were online friends for almost three years before they met in person. Both men were part of a local bulletin board system, BBS, remember those? An early version of an online community. People would connect through their rotary phones and modems. The community was small, friendly, and diverse. Users of BBSs would chat with somebody on the other side of town or engaged in text-based fantasy games like Legend of the Red Dragon. Users got to know each other through games and chats, and there were modem meetups that might attract five people, maybe 50, to a pool hall, someone's apartment, or a movie theater. These communities were a far cry from the ease and simplicity of internet connections today as people connected through their phone lines. The community was restricted to Vancouver, where long-distance charges would not apply. Johnny used the alias Ultra Magnus, a beloved character from the Transformers series, in these communities. Although Johnny moved back to Edmonton in 2001, his interest in computers and the connections they could facilitate never waned. Johnny's passion for technology served him vocationally as well. He made ends meet working the night shift at Argus Machine, an oil field equipment manufacturer located just south of Edmonton. He was proud of his job, overseeing quality control, checking machine parts, and meticulously measuring them. Johnny's apartment was well kept, featuring a white leather couch along one wall large enough for two adults to lie on. He was an enthusiastic paintball player and had a paintball gun. Johnny had also developed a passion for motorcycles, almost as strong as his childhood love of computers, and he owned two bikes, a Honda 500cc and a Yamaha 1200cc sport touring bike. He cherished his motorcycles, treating and caring for them like his babies. When he had to leave town, he carefully covered the touring bike and sometimes asked friends to look after it. His motorcycle helmet and jacket were always within reach if the desire for a ride overtook him, which was often. As Johnny approached his 40s, he developed an interest in spirituality and metaphysics. He believed in reincarnation and occasionally attended spiritual talks with his friend Deborah Tykrub, whom he dated romantically at one point. And their relationship had transformed into a warm friendship, but that was Johnny Altinger. You know, this guy mm -hmm. sounds alive, passionate, interested in things and interesting. Yeah. Right? Like, you're, you're describing him, and I'm like, you know what? I would have been a friend of his. Sure. Right? He just... Me too. He's a guy that, like, yeah. gets into things and and, mm -hmm. and and has some talent, right? Exactly. In everything that he's doing. I, I, I'm, I'm liking this guy. Yeah, and this is another reason why I wanted to redo this, because I don't feel like I got into that enough. And about who he was. As about who he was. And, which is important. And right? I've become kind of proud of that as part of our show, so... How you develop the yeah. show. Yeah. Naturally. Johnny was described as a positive, upbeat person who tried to get people to turn negative thoughts into positive ones. He regularly chatted with friends and acquaintances online and looked for love on dating websites such as Plenty of Fish and LavaLife.com. Although he didn't find his ultimate goal, a wife, the internet allowed Johnny to meet people and make good friends. Johnny's interest in finding a partner had also grown by the summer of 2008. He tried to rekindle a romantic relationship with Deborah Tykrub but they decided to remain friends, although Johnny wanted more. In June of 2008, Johnny called to discuss their relationship. Deborah's conversation with Johnny helped him to realize that they were friends, and that would be it. They both moved on after that. A few of Johnny's male friends knew about Jen, a user he'd met on Plenty of Fish, who he seemed excited to meet in person. On the 10th of October at approximately 5.30 p.m., Johnny received a message from his co-worker, Willie, on MSN Messenger, inquiring about his plans for the evening. Johnny boasted to Willie about his upcoming date with Jen, and even sent him a link to Jen's profile on the dating site, Plenty of Fish, which featured a photo of her in a bikini. 
Johnny informed Willie that he was scheduled to meet Jen at her house at 7 p.m., but that her instructions for getting there seemed strange. Jen had refused to give him her phone number and street address, instead providing him with convoluted directions to the house and then to enter through the garage. Willie found the situation concerning and requested that Johnny text him the address once he arrived. Johnny quickly copied and pasted Jen's directions into an email and sent them to Willie at about 6 p.m. Perhaps sensing something was off, Johnny called his best buddy since elementary school, Dale Smith, to tell him about his date and the unusual instructions. Dale didn't trust dating sites. He'd heard a few horror stories, so he was not pleased to hear about the situation and requested that Johnny call him with the address once he arrived at Jen's house. Johnny promised he would. Johnny hopped into his red Mazda 3 and followed Jen's directions, showing up at the garage around 30 minutes before the planned meeting. Johnny parked in the driveway and walked toward the half-open garage door, ducking to enter the darkened structure. Johnny called out, Hello. There was no answer. He called out again, and a man's voice answered, telling him to hang on. The garage lights came on, revealing a man in his late twenties with a medium build, short dark hair, and a receding hairline. The garage's walls and ceiling were covered with plastic sheeting, as was a metal table in the middle of the room. The man introduced himself as Mark and told Johnny he was a filmmaker and he was setting up the garage for a film that he was making. Mark showed Johnny a BB gun that he said was a prop for the film, revealing the plastic BBs it was loaded with. Jen had warned Johnny that he might run into a man in the garage, and Johnny assumed this was who she'd met. Mark said that Jen was not home yet, but Johnny could wait around if he wanted. Johnny decided he'd head home and return at the agreed time. Johnny left and while driving he used his cell phone and called Dale to tell him briefly that Jen hadn't been home and about the strange meeting in the garage with Mark the filmmaker. When Johnny got home, there was an apologetic email from Jen waiting for him on his laptop. She offered to postpone the date if Johnny wanted, but Johnny wanted to meet her. He replied telling Jen that he'd head right over. Johnny sent a final email at around 7 p.m. to Dale indicating that he was returning to the garage to meet the elusive Jen. The email read, She's home now. I'm heading over again. Hee hee. Johnny got into his car and returned to the garage. Oh no. Yeah. Listening to this and knowing what happens, you're just like, no, don't do it. Dale saw Johnny's email later that evening. He grew concerned again as Johnny had not called back with the address as he'd promised. Dale called Johnny's number three times that night before heading to bed and was met with Johnny's voicemail message each time. Dale called Johnny's number on Saturday morning and was met with the same result. All weekend, messages from a few of Johnny's other friends went unanswered and one noted Altinger hadn't logged into MSN Messenger since Friday, which was rare. Dale, in particular, could not shake the feeling that something was wrong. It wasn't like Johnny not to answer, even if he was having fun with a new girlfriend. After Thanksgiving dinner on the 12th, Dale got another couple of buddies and went by Johnny's place. Johnny's car was not in its usual spot. They knocked at his front door. They received no answer, so they walked around to the patio door, knocked again, and peered inside. Again, there was no answer and no movement within Johnny's condo. What had become of Johnny Altinger? According to Steve Lillibuin's book, The Devil Cinema, a co-worker of Johnny's was the first to get an email from one of Johnny's accounts at around 8.42 a.m. on October 13, 2008. The email read in part, Hey man, the girl and I hit it off big time. I know it's only been a few days, but I think I'm falling hard, and she feels the same way. Johnny then said that the pair were heading off to Costa Rica, and the note continued, Never done anything so spontaneous, and it would be a great experience to get in before I die. End quote. Johnny's boss received an emailed resignation from Johnny's account. His rarely used Facebook status was updated. Johnny Altinger is taking off to the Caribbean for a few months. See you all when I get back. End quote. Johnny's Plenty of Fish account was deleted soon after that. That day, Dale received an email from Johnny's account telling him that Johnny was running off to Costa Rica with Jen, his newfound love. The email read, quote, Hey there, I've met an extraordinary woman named Jen who has offered to take me on a nice long tropical vacation. We'll be staying in her winter home in Costa Rica. Phone number to follow soon. 
I won't be back in town until December 10th, but I will be checking my email periodically. See you around the holidays. Johnny. End quote. Deborah Tycrop got the same email. Deborah found the note strange because Johnny usually signed off his emails with a joke or a smiley face, and he had not addressed her as Sunshine, his usual pet name for her. Deborah immediately felt something wasn't quite right. It felt so cold. Later on, Deborah noticed Johnny's MSN Messenger account as signed in. His new status was, quote, I've got a one-way ticket to heaven, and I'm never coming back, end quote. More after a quick break. And we are back, Matthew. Thoughts so far? You know, I think um, it's cases like this that um, unfortunately brought to light for the rest of us mm. sort of some of the, the importance of being careful when you're online dating. Sure, yeah. Um, if anything good at all ever is to come out of this is um, for people to learn to sort of protect themselves. Yeah, online dating isn't a thing that I've done. So I don't know how people protect themselves really like how do you do you research a person who you're you're considering you know meeting up with or there's lots of things you can do so um you know i think if you're meeting somebody meet them in public mm -hmm. uh, take your own transportation sure so don't get into a stranger's car yeah right um a lot of people that i know i'd never done this because i didn't want people to to see how much of a slut i was <laughs> with the number of dates i was getting back in the day sure, but sure. you know given say like a friend who won't slut shame you tell them the address of the place you're going sure. right or text someone you're there so yeah. so that they they know where you've gone yeah but i think those are some things and i think also you know, use a first name. I don't give people too much information until you, you get to know them, right? Yeah. Like where you live and all these things. Yeah, it, it works for both ways, though. You know, it's yeah. like you could be meeting up with a scary person. I don't know. Have you ever met anybody scary online? Scary? No. Yeah. Like total, total um, catfish. Like you were not the person in the picture, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I just say, bye-bye. Yeah. So Dale contacted the police, but when the officer he was speaking to heard that Johnny had allegedly run off with an internet date, the cop waved Dale away. According to the officer, a middle-aged man going on a spontaneous romantic trip with a woman he didn't know did not sound like a crime had taken place, and some may even consider it fortunate. The officer believed that launching an investigation would misuse police resources. On October 16, 2008, Johnny's Facebook was updated again. The status read, Wondering why anyone would leave sun and surf to come back to snow and stress. Replies from friends went unanswered, as did emails, MSN messages, and Facebook messages. On the 17th of October, as police were ignoring him, Dale had had enough. He and a married couple... Mutual friends of Johnny's went to Altinger's condo to see if they could discover anything about Johnny's sudden disappearance. One of Johnny's windows was ajar, and after some brief debate, the woman in the trio crawled through the window and unlocked the door for the two men to enter. These are the kind of friends you want. Yeah, yeah, people who are going to say, you know, something's really fishy here. I hope you'd break into my place. Uh, I might have a trouble with that. Maybe I'd have to wait until somebody left the door open. <laughs> kind of have thing. you ever done sort of mountain climbing? You could climb up the outside of the I'm building. not Spider-Man. <laughs> I don't want to climb up 39 floors. But no, I, I agree. Like, these are the kind of friends that you want. There were dirty pots on the stove and dishes in the sink. They went through everything they could think of. They couldn't find Johnny's laptop anywhere in the condo. Johnny's luggage was still in the closet along with his beach towel. Johnny's shaving kit and grooming items, including his toothbrush, were in the bathroom. If Johnny had run off to Costa Rica, he'd not have taken anything he would have needed. So when Dale found Johnny's passport in his bedroom dresser, the alarm bells went into overdrive. There's no way he could have traveled to Costa Rica without that. Police finally began to take Dale's concerns seriously. Edmonton Police Services Constable Christopher Maxwell was assigned to the file. 
On October 18, 2018, Maxwell followed the directions that Johnny had forwarded to Dale, which took him to the garage where Johnny was to meet Jen. The address was 5712 40th Avenue Northwest in the Millwoods neighborhood. The garage was locked and unoccupied. A quick bit of police work led to discovering the garage was rented to a 29-year-old man named Mark Andrew Twitchell. Maxwell called the number Twitchell's landlord had provided him. Maxwell asked Mark Twitchell if he was the tenant who'd rented the garage. Mark admitted he was the garage's tenant. Maxwell then asked when Mark had been last at the garage. Mark said he'd been there on the 10th. Maxwell asked Mark if a woman had been at the garage that night to meet a man. Mark said that he had not seen a woman there and didn't know anything about any meeting. Maxwell then asked Mark if he'd seen a red Mazda 3 at the garage that night, and Mark said he had not. Maxwell asked Mark if he could meet him at the garage to let him inside. The officer said he'd like to have a look in the garage and was following up on a missing persons report. Mark agreed and said he'd be right over. Maxwell and another officer were waiting for Twitchell when he arrived at 11.25 p.m., Mark looked at the padlock on the door and stated that it didn't belong to him and that he didn't have the key. He claimed someone had replaced the lock since he'd been there eight days before. With Twitchell's consent, the police broke the lock and entered the garage, where Maxwell noticed a strong smell of something burnt. Inside, Maxwell observed a burned residue in a large oil drum-sized barrel. Twitchell claimed that the barrel was a garbage receptacle and the burned residue was unusual. He said he had no idea what had been burned there. Additionally, Constable Maxwell observed various cleaning supplies, including an empty plastic bottle of ammonia, a plastic wrapper for a 9 foot by 12 foot plastic drop cloth, an empty wrapper for rubber gloves, a multi pack of paper towels missing three rolls, a large container of all purpose cleaner, two almost empty rolls of duct tape, and the remains of a broken padlock bracket. Twitchell told Maxwell that the broken bracket was the original one attached to the garage door. In the room, Maxwell also observed a large metal table and a chair made of angle iron. Twitchell claimed that they were props for a movie he was filming, where an actor is ultimately stabbed and killed while restrained to the chair by duct tape. Twitchell further advised that the byproduct of such a production is residue left by a cornstarch-based product used to represent blood. Twitchell told Maxwell that he purchased the cleaning products and plastic tarp and used them to clean up his props and equipment. Mark was allowed to go home that night. However, he wasted no time and called one of his filmmaking crew friends, informing them that something strange had happened at the garage. He mentioned that some of his things had been rearranged since October 10th. Mark Andrew Twitchell was born in Edmonton, Alberta on July 4, 1979. Growing up, classmates described him as an outsider who was frequently bullied. Mark Twitchell was an avid lover of science fiction and make-believe, often donning costumes to portray his favorite film characters and act out scenes. His ultimate goal was to become a famous filmmaker. However, his nerdy interests and peculiar last name often made him the target of bullying, leading to him being called Twitch hell by his classmates. The use of the word twit in his surname certainly didn't go unnoticed by his tormentors. According to Steve Lillibuen's book, The Devil's Cinema, Mark Twitchell tended to rebel, often resorting to lies and tall tales to get what he wanted. His love for junk food drove him to steal money from his mother's purse. Despite being caught shoplifting at grocery stores twice, he managed to avoid a criminal record by participating in the court's alternative measures program for first-time offenders. After graduating from Archbishop O'Leary High School in 1997, Mark enrolled in radio and television arts at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, Nate. While at school, he was known as a bit of a loner and unreliable regarding group projects. In 1999, while standing in line for the Star Wars Episode I movie premiere, Mark Twitchell auctioned off what he claimed was original concept art from the film. However, his friend believed the art was fake, and they grew apart. People would have seen a major red flag had they been paying any real attention. Mark Twitchell's unexplainable love for the abomination known as Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace. 
Star Wars fans like myself had eagerly awaited the release of Episode One to kick off what we all hoped would be an amazing prequel trilogy to the beloved franchise. On May 19, 1999, the film opened to scores of sold-out audiences. What a disappointment. I remember sitting in the theater that night as the credits rolled and the lights came up, thinking, what the hell did I just see? It was like George Lucas took a time machine back to the 70s and asked a group of preschoolers to create a Star Wars movie. We got a cringeworthy flatulent alien with a voice that could make you want to join the dark side. And let's not forget about that infamous pod racing scene. It was so long and boring that it made the Kessel Run look like a quick trip to the grocery store. And don't even get us started on the midichlorians. Seriously, George, why did you have to ruin the force? The only thing that saved this movie was the lightsaber duel at the end, but even that couldn't save it from being a banthesized pile of poop. Watching The Phantom Menace is like getting your hopes up for a delicious pizza only to find a cardboard box with a picture of a pizza on it. It's like expecting a juicy steak and getting a dry piece of leather instead. Tell me how you really feel about <laughs> I hate it. Did you? I hate it. And when I was standing in line with George Lucas at a Starbucks downtown mm -hmm. uh, where I used to work, I almost asked him, what in the fuck did you do? But I didn't want to, you know, no. he's just there getting coffee. You know, <laughs> you know. Finally, my sister-in-law and I were talking about this movie and Jar Jar Binks like two weeks ago. Oh, really? And I swear to God, I told her like I, I said, yeah, you're like a world's leading expert in Jar Jar because she loved the character. Misa's are so stupid. She loved the character, and she couldn't understand why people didn't like it. So she's done all this research on it. Oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah. That Mark Twitchell loved The Phantom Menace so much should have tipped everyone off that something was desperately wrong with him. Mark became obsessed with the internet as well, buying and selling Star Wars toys online and using early dating sites to meet women. He met Megan Castorella, a young woman from Colorado, and Megan fell for Mark's charm, and they were married just months after meeting in person. Little did she know about the extent of his fantasies and obsession with movies. Mark could get so lost in a character or a movie that he wanted to emulate it. It's like he was living in a world of his own creation, but not a creative one. It was a world of someone else's creation. Mark's darker, true nature soon revealed itself. Mark was a liar. Megan told the CBC's Fifth Estate that it was initially small things, such as claiming he'd paid a bill and Mark's story would change when the collectors would call. Megan was well aware of Twitchell's extensive time on the internet creating fake and often peculiar identities that he would use to interact with others in chat rooms or on dating websites. Megan believed that Mark got a kick out of messing with people, but one question out of the blue now haunts her. Mark Twitchell asked his wife if she'd ever considered what it would be like to kill someone. Megan replied that everyone might have had such thoughts but would never act on them. Mark then revealed that he thought that way often and even considered killing a homeless person for the experience. Megan was shocked and realized she didn't know him as well as she thought. Megan and Mark had moved to Peoria, Illinois, where Mark was employed as an electronic appliance salesman from 2002 to 2004. He hated the job, resented his bosses, and dreamt of a higher station in life, something creative, something where he called the shots, like filmmaking. He fancied himself the next George Lucas, because he couldn't be the first Mark Twitchell, because that would be an original thing. As well as obsessively buying and selling Star Wars toys online, he was on the computer into the wee hours. Megan also discovered that Mark had been unfaithful to her multiple times and had continued lying to her about their finances. She'd had enough, and they divorced in 2004. Mark moved back to Edmonton to pursue his dreams of becoming a filmmaker and began to work on a fan film based in the Star Wars universe called Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion. Okay, so two things. Yeah. Number one, and I'm not slamming Edmonton, this is just not where the industry is. True. If you're an aspiring filmmaker, you don't move to Edmonton. No, you move to Vancouver or Toronto if you're Canadian. Vancouver, Toronto, Los or LA Angeles, if, right? Yeah. Second thing is, does this guy have an original thought in his head? No, and I get into that later on, but he just, like yeah. He's, like, he's making something like, you know, I picture like a 12-year-old boy mm -hmm. doing, oh, you know, taking his camcorder and, and like, I'm going to make a Star Wars thing, not like somebody who's seriously trying to be seriously taken as a filmmaker. Well, he was seriously doing his thing. 
Seriously being a dick. During the summer of 2006, Mark Twitchell used the Nate campus and a small film crew to shoot his unsanctioned Star Wars fan film. Despite knowing he couldn't make money from it due to Lucasfilm's legal team, he was determined to showcase his talents in costuming, storytelling, and filmmaking. The film got some local media attention in Edmonton, but to this day it's never been released in any form. Mark was passionate about dressing up as his favorite superheroes and sci-fi characters like Wolverine, Spider-Man, and Darth Maul. He even won $3,000 in a Harley Davidson by building an intricate seven and a half foot bumblebee costume from the Transformers franchise for a Halloween contest. Though some thought he was just a nerdy creative type, Twitchell's love of Star Wars continued to run so deep that the license plate for his maroon 2003 Pontiac Grand Am was DRK Jedi. He continued to troll the internet and met his next wife, Jess, on the dating site Plenty of Fish. They got married and had a daughter named Chloe. Mark Twitchell purchased a new home for his family using fraudulent documents. In the summer of 2008, Jess caught Mark looking at a website for married people looking to have affairs. She suspected he was lying about his movie research and hired an actor to lie to her about the project. His marriage to Jess began to unravel. While Mark was busy downstairs with his costumes and screenplays, Jess had moved upstairs to sleep alone. She was making an effort to stick around for their young daughter, Chloe. Like Megan, Mark lied to Jess. He quit his day job without telling his wife and began paying household bills by living off investors' money, investors in his films. They were attending couples counseling, and Mark claimed he was seeing a psychiatrist regularly, but he was not. In reality, he spent all his time working on his next short film, House of Cards, but a man who falls victim to a horrific catfishing case. The victim believes he will meet a girl in a garage he has met online, but instead he is tied up, tortured, and murdered by a screenwriter who kills people as research for his films. In September 2008, Mark Twitchell completed filming the eight-minute short film, which he hoped would one day become a feature. The set was the rented garage that Johnny Altinger would be lured to only a month later. Mark had taken inspiration for the short from the TV show Dexter and had begun to emulate the character's tendencies. Everything Twitchell did seemed to be derivative of something else. For those unfamiliar, Dexter is a crime thriller television series that aired from 2006 to 2013. It revolves around Dexter Morgan, a blood spatter analyst for the Miami Metro Police Department who leads a secret double life as a vigilante serial killer targeting and killing other murderers who have evaded justice. The series explores themes of morality, justice, and the psychology of a serial killer, as well as Dexter's personal relationships and struggles to hide this dark secret. Mark repeatedly mentioned the fictional character Dexter Morgan in Facebook posts, and in late September and early October 2008, Mark became obsessed with making his own storyline a reality, with him as a star. Mark was browsing Plenty of Fish again, creating a new profile. This time, not as himself, but posing as a woman for whom he'd created an entire fake backstory, just like the villain in his House of Cards screenplay had done. Mark called himself Sheena, and he used the clever name Spiderwebs with two Zs instead of an S at the end. Sheena's physical description, 5 foot 6 inches tall with blonde hair and blue eyes, was backed up by photos he'd found online of some random woman. No one, he thought, would be the wiser. He began receiving messages from men on the site, and finally, he had a real prize fish on the line, a man named Gilles Tetro. Tetro was new to Edmonton and looking to meet women. He'd been smitten with Sheena's profile pic, and the fact that she too was a recent transplant from BC made her even more attractive to him. They'd have lots to talk about, Tetro thought. Sheena and Tetro made plans to meet, and Sheena gave Tetro directions to the garage at 5712 40th Avenue Northwest. It was a full week before Johnny Altinger's fateful meeting at the same property. But this rendezvous didn't go as Mark Twitchell had planned. In our next episode, we'll hear more about Mark Twitchell's encounter with Jill Tetro and learn about what happened to Johnny Altinger and how Mark Twitchell eventually got his comeuppance. And that's it for. Episode 265, Hollow Man, The Crimes of Mark Twitchell, Part 1.
That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty. Uh, let's listen to our first voicemail. Matthew's just making funnies here. Uh, so anyway, let's move forward. I, I think this one's from uh, someone who uh, people will be familiar with. Uh, interesting. Oh, hey, uh, Mike and Matt. It's uh, the devil calling here. Just calling to say hello and see how you two are doing. Uh, don't worry. I know how you're doing. I've been watching you two. Always watching you. Speaking about watching, I really like that episode about the Cold War and the Spies. That really uh, tickled my fancy. You know, so much of it happened in Ottawa. Funny, but fancy that, eh? Hey, tell me a little bit. Anywho, uh, uh, my love to Steve. I love you, big guy. Love you, Steve. Mm-hmm. You're a good dog, yes, yes, you are. Okay, okay. The devil away. So, uh, yeah, again, Satan is calling. It, I think, Matthew, you have attracted the devil to this show. I think that's great big Satan. I think it is great big Satan. You are correct. He lives in hell. Yes. And he does fire and brimstone for a living. Well, there you go. We we obviously have to give great big Satan a job. Uh, yes, he he's not a nice person, but he's nice enough to call in and he seems to love Steve. I think the person behind great big Satan is a nice person. I think so too. Yeah. Anyway, here is another voicemail. This looks like it is coming to us from New York, but not New York City. Oh. Anyway, so let's have a listen. Hey, guys. My name is Steph Hampel. I'm actually from New York. It's a really uh, small, very small town in way, way, way upstate. Um, I always joke that um, it's southern Canada. I don't always always want to say that I'm from the United States. Um, anyway... I love what you guys do, and I've always wanted to call in, but I've never really had anything to say in particular. Um, But then the most recent episode, the Vanishing of Brianna episode, um, Michael said, no, sorry, Matthew said something about the opera, and he made the comment, uh, one night at the opera, he saw an Aida, and I literally laughed out loud because when I was a kid, I was obsessed with that song. I just thought it was the funniest thing ever, and um, I, you can just imagine a little 10-year-old kid going, but I, he watched her fall into the pit, downwind by the weight of those terrible kids. So, um, yeah, it was funny, and I loved that song. I actually loved the whole movie, and I still love Bette Midler. So you kind of brought me back to my childhood there, and I I appreciated that greatly. Um, Also, I have a question because there is an ongoing debate between one of my old coworkers and myself about the word poutine. She is also from actually even further north uh, in New York than I am, and she says it's pronounced poutine. I don't, I'm probably butchering that. And I've always said, well, yeah, but the guys on Dark Poutine who are from Canada say poutine. So I am curious about the pronunciation. Is it like a different part of the country says it one way or like one area says it one way and another area says it another way? I mean, that sort of stuff happens everywhere. So if you could please end the debate on how you say poutine. I'm going with poutine because that's how you guys say it. So I just need proof from someone so I can tell her she's wrong. Um, Anyway, again, I love what you guys do. I love your show. I'm thrilled that I had an opportunity to uh, call in and uh, say something, even though I was super nervous and actually dialed the number wrong the first time and got some really weird voicemail. So that was a little sketchy. Anyway, thanks, and uh, go take a shit in your hat. Bye. Well, there you go. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, we it's regional pronunciation. The the Quebec French pronunci- pronunci- pronunciation of poutine. Yeah, and the, the rest of us... Is poutine. Just the rest of us are like, poutine! Poutine. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's regional. It's regional thing. Like, I've had people call me in, call me up and read me about, you know, you're pronounced... <laughs> You are pronouncing it wrong. It's poutine. And it's like, I know how to pronounce it. I just don't. 
You're not French. I'm not French. Did Steph has a little bit of an Irish accent. Maybe she's Did Irish. You hear that? She could be like of Irish descent. Also, we never say like up province. Up province? So she said she's upstate New York. Yeah. Yep. We, we never say up province. <laughs> Up your province, man. Up, up, up your province, Mike. <laughs> and Steph she will be happy to know. Okay. This is so funny that she brought that up. I got a table singing that song in a cafe about three weeks ago. Oh, that's funny. Right. I was with people who knew it as well, so we all started singing it. It was hilarious. There you go. Um, so what do you think Steph does for work there in that small town in upstate New York, Matthew? She, she sells brasiers. Brasiers? Or maybe she, yeah, she, her store is called Titslinger's Brasiers. <laughs> Titslinger's. Uh, I used to call them when I was a little kid and I was being cheeky, over shoulder boulder holders. Well, that's from the song as well. As well. Oh, there you go. The over the shoulder boulder holder. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. I didn't know where it came from. You, I just heard it somewhere. You have to play yourself in that song. It's so funny. Okay, I will do. Yeah. Uh, we have one more voicemail this week. Uh, let's have another listen. It might be another person whom we're familiar with. Who knows? Hey, boys. Great Big Pete here. Just wanted to say you did an episode about the uh, torso murder, which was really interesting. Um, I, it reminded me of a song that I heard as a as a young lad growing up in uh, here in Ontario. And it was a song called Mrs. Dick, Mrs. Evelyn Dick by the Forgotten Rebels. And uh, basically uh, enumerates the ways uh, in which uh, the, the body was uh, killed. Anyways, kind of kind of creepy, kind of gross. But uh, now I've actually got a backstory to the song and I feel kind of creeped out for having liked it for all that time. Anywho, uh, I love you both. Uh, my love to Steve. See, I'm, I'm giving him scritches, 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 scritches. And, uh, yeah, take care. All right. Bye. Great big Pete calling again. We did mention that song, I think, very briefly in the episode. He might have missed it. But, I mean, it, it is interesting, The Forgotten Rebels. There's a few people who have done creative things around how could you miss his dick. <laughs> oh, I can't, you, you know, you kind of have to write that. It's just this, this story wrote itself, really. Matthew, you're just like looking there. You seem to be deep in thought. I was just thinking about other Forgotten Rebel song. There's one that I think now is probably horribly racist, but they did a song called Elvis is Dead. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah, well, Elvis is Dead. And In Love With The System, that was a good song. I'm going to have to listen. And they were punk, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, so punk, they don't care. They don't care. They don't care. Anyway. They don't give a punk. They don't give a punk. Let's move on to uh, some other things. That's it for voicemails. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right. Uh, so first up... As far as patrons go, we have the guys from Blaine, Washington, who do That Taxi Podcast. So if you want to find them, go to thattaxipodcast.com, and you can listen to them talk about all kinds of interesting things from Mortal Kombat to Got Any Grapes. That's one of their episode titles, Got Any Grapes. Uh, the Sticker Mystery, uh, they do. Uh, did a really special episode where they talked to people who are in the process of uh, transitioning. transitioning. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're interesting guys who live right below us in Blaine. Like, so the first place you reach when okay. you cross the border is Blaine. After the peace arch. After the peace arch. Okay. So they want us to come down and go out for dinner and oh, all that kind of it. stuff. let's do it. We should have them on the after show. We should have them on the after show and they should have us on their show. Yeah, that would be good. I like his, he has a good goatee. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like that, he gives good goatee. They both have good goatees. Oh, I can't see the other one. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they have, they both have sort of, they're beardy. Yeah. yeah. Those, are, those are proper beards. Yeah. So nice. let, let's have a conversation with them. Let's do it. So check them out, folks. That Taxi Podcast. And thank you, 
so much, guys, for your patronage. Much appreciated. It looks like a really interesting podcast. Yeah. Uh, there are 36 episodes in, so, and I think a new Boom. one's about to drop. Nice. So, so they're on their way. And it's good to see, like, folks just starting out who are just plowing into it. And you doing know? it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I love it. Uh, next we have Kim Gore's line. And I don't know where Kim is from, uh, so we're going to have to figure that out first. Matthew, put on your geography hat. She's from Whalebone Alley in Siberia. Whoa! Yep. What a cool place. Yep. I, I love that name, Whalebone Alley. Yep. Uh, what does she do there in Whalebone Alley? Carvings. So she carves whalebone. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Like, does she have something uh, in particular that she she sort of focuses on? Mandalorian. The Mandalorian from Star Wars? Yeah, that's what she carves. Well, that's really cool, out of whalebone. Yeah. I want one. There you go. So if anybody, Kim, if you can get me a whalebone Mandalorian... Uh, I would love that. The whales die naturally, by the way. Yeah, they just, they actually donate their bodies to carvers. She just finds, <laughs> she just finds them and she carves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No whales were intentionally hurt in no, the they, they, of the Mandalorian. I think they will them to her. They will their they bodies. Will, they will their body to art. Yes, exactly. Anyway, that's it for <laughs> patrons. <laughs> Thank you. And we don't have any donut money donors this week, but, you know, you could donate if you like. Dark Team Podcast at gmail.com. You're looking at me, Willie. Or you can find us at Patreon, patreon.com slash Dark Poutine. Yeah. Nice. Yes, it is nice. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash Dark Poutine. For a one time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode. Uh, until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Bye.